Taipei is really cold. And it's like, you lived in Singapore for <laughs> That's right. 10 years and you still <laughs> think it's cold. <laughs> We're good? Yeah, we're good. Until I think it's okay. Do you guys that Yeah, you can. Sure, we can just, now. Yeah. yeah, we can. We can actually. Good laptop, so I have notes. Mm -hmm. Oh, gee. No, it's fine. It's fine. Oh, okay. It's great. It's totally great. No, it's okay. You can put, you can, you can put it on the table. Yeah, okay. Okay. We, we, really... We've, we've well, already yeah, yeah, dodged it's, the, it's the, really the good. lines of stuff. Okay. okay. Yeah, it's just right. good. Yeah. Bigger because I'm old. That's fine. Okay, so um, uh, I guess to uh, I guess to start off. Sure. Um, so next week is the uh, Salzburg Global mm -hmm. uh, Law and Technology Forum. Mm -hmm. Since you can't uh, can't be there, but I happen to be here in Taiwan. I, I can't physically be there. Yeah. I, I we consider sending a robot, but it turns out the castle is a wheelchair friendly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, guys, this is just sort of a uh, a hint that uh, we should be looking at uh, uh, some new ways to enable telepresence, uh, or we should develop quadruped robots. Quadruped robots. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, the lab here could probably come up with it too. That's right. Taiwan seems to be the home of robotics. That's right, yeah. definitely, very much so. So, uh, so I thought it'd be great to get your thoughts on um, on the topics that we'll be discussing there, and uh, what I'd like to do is record the record this, and we're recording now, um, uh, so we can get your comments mm -hmm. uh, uh, to the participants. Yeah. Um, and so I really appreciate the time that you're taking uh, to do this. Um, so Salzburg Global is a uh, is a nonprofit uh, organization um, that brings jurists, technologists, um, policymakers from around the world together to bridge divides and uh, enable uh, collaborations um, at, at, at multiple levels, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's uh, from a, a legal perspective mm -hmm. to uh, to looking for solutions at a at a grassroots mm -hmm. level, um, and um, it's the thought is that building these networks uh, across um, a diverse set of individuals um, and uh, these participants, this uh, confluence of participants uh, will uh, seed uh, different ideas and enable change. Mm -hmm. um, and when the th one of the topics which has be uh, become uh, quite um, are quite challenging for uh, uh, for uh, for countries around the world is um, the impact of uh, technology on uh, privacy, security, and and even ethics. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's been like that since the industrial revolution. Right. At first, at first, at first, it was you know there was a newspaper, then it became radio, <laughs> yes. and then it was TV. Yeah. Now it's now it's the internet. It's the internet's yeah. turn finally. Yeah. Um, so well, let's start with the basics. Mm -hmm. uh, not everybody knows who you are. Mm -hmm. um, could you tell the audience uh, uh, mm -hmm. about your role as mm -hmm. Taiwan's first digital minister? Sure. Hi, I'm Audrey Tang. Uh, I'm Taiwan's digital minister in charge of open government and social innovation. Um, this post is new. Uh, I joined the cabinet in 2016, but I've been advising uh, the cabinet since late 2014 after the Sunflower uh, Movement. The Sunflower Movement is a movement where people occupy the parliament because the MPs at the time were refusing to deliberate a trade service deal uh, with Beijing, uh, and so people just took the parliament and did the MPs job for them because they were on strike. That's a legitimacy theory anyway. Uh, but but uh, the, the plus of that movement and it demonstrated to the entire country that it is possible when you have half a million people on the street and many more online to get to some sort of rough consensus after 22 days of Occupy. And so people have been really looking forward for the digital to not uh, create opposition or to amplify the polarized opinions, but rather bring people together as we did uh, day after day uh, since the Occupy and then um, just get people's general fear 
uncertainty and doubt around digital technologies and turn them into a plurality instead of a very narrow-minded singularity point of view, which always uh, antagonizes people. Right, and so you've implemented uh, uh, in several initiatives to enable mm -hmm. open government here right. in Taiwan. So there's, uh, there's V Taiwan. That's there right. is which, Join, which is every evening here. So literally, there's a you know pizza gathering every Wednesday. So today is uh, my office hour. So here, anyone can come and visit me and have forty minutes of my time, uh, like we do now. Uh, and uh, as long as everything is uh, published under Creative Commons on the internet. And I also tour around Taiwan to meet with people in rural indigenous places while we connect back to the 12th ministry here in the Social Innovation Lab, again, as a way of participatory rulemaking. And anyone, when they get 5,000 e-petitions on a joint platform, can summon me anywhere. So like next week, uh, I'll be summoned to the Bado Fishing Harbor uh, because the fishes people there would like all the harbors in Taiwan be open for fishing. But the fishes people uh, maybe don't like it that much. So we'll be summoned there to solve the local issue uh, that has a national impact. And finally, there's Be Taiwan, which is volunteer run uh, by the Dev Zero project and that experiments with very avant garde type AI power conversations and things like that for issues concerning digital economy. And tell me about the successes uh, uh, that you've found mm -hmm. through uh, V Taiwan mm -hmm. or, or sure. Joan. Joan. Sure. Right, so v Taiwan is the earlier one. Uh, the, uh, so its main claim to success is actually the government trusting the civil society enough to run a multi-stakeholder conversation process that led to various things. For example, it led to the diversified taxi plan, which is a compromise between the Uber uh, camp on one side and the existing taxi on one side, or uh, that it led to the FinTech sandbox, which is a, a way to get people's uh, ideas tried out in in the wild for one year, uh, and we took it from the UK and Singapore really, but then we uh, took that sandbox model and applied it to self-driving vehicle, to 5G, to platform economy, so anywhere you're in Taiwan, we, you can just apply for a sandbox experiment for one year, and if the regulators think it's a really good idea, esteemed by the society, we merge it back into the regulation. It, it's a kind of trade for one year monopoly, uh, and in return for people to open up the data and the lessons learned, and if it doesn't work, well, everybody learns something, and uh, the innovation can try another different angle. And v Taiwan has also been used uh, to make uh, laws in the new company law concerning social enterprises and benefit corporations in the sense that co companies used to be for profit only, but now they can declare their public purpose and then are not, uh, you know, just profit only, but rather working on one of the sustainable development goals. And so, um, yeah, all of these were creations uh, of process led from the v Taiwan uh, discussion group, and it finally formalized into the joint platform where all the budgets, all the regulatory pre-announcement for 60 days, as well as e-petitions and participatory budgeting are all on the one-stop shop uh, in the joint platform. Uh, that is run by the central government. And then the central government basically appoints a team of participation officers in each ministries in charge of directly uh, having a dialogue with the civil society on anything that is on e-petition or on regulatory announcement that captures public attention. Okay. I, that's going to be fun uh, transcripting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're, you're writing the transcript for this? No, it's fine. We can okay. provide a transcript. And okay. actually, we're going to upload to YouTube, which usually get a transcript about 80%. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Uh, it's, uh, it's automated. Mm -hmm. oh. oh, that's going to be very handy. Yeah. Um, a for AI. Yeah. Um, okay, so... Um, these participate uh, these participatory platforms mm -hmm. now how I guess the biggest fear that most people have mm -hmm. on the online side is dealing with trolls oh, yeah how does no, we're very good at troll control. Yeah, so um, the very simple one shot answer is you take away the reply button once you take away the reply button, trolls really have nowhere to play because trolls attach uh, to the online discussions by making ad hominem attacks and uh, you know derail the, the threat for a discussion. But if you don't have threat, you have you don't have the threat of derailing the threat. And so our usual design, for example, using the Polis platform, which is the AI-based uh, conversation platform that we just alluded to, uh, it basically all, all you can do for other people's reflections or feelings about a particular matter is that you can say, 
agree or disagree on one statement posted by your fellow citizens, and once you click it, you move alongside the people who share the same、uh, ideas or feelings with you, and you can discover that people on the other aisle are actually also your friends, and it's just you didn't talk about particular things over dinner. So they are not nameless enemies, and if five thousand people came and vote exactly the same way, we're not counting. The head counts. We're counting the diversity of opinion. So five thousand people coming voting exactly the same is just going to be one dot. It's not going to change substantially the agenda. And so, based on the same facts, we're using this way to ask people, "What are your feelings to those facts?" You can feel happy. You can feel angry. It's all okay. But more often than not, when、um, faced with such an interface where you just click, keep clicking agree, disagree, or pass. People will want to share their more nuanced, eclectic feelings after a few yes or no, right? For other people to vote on, and <clears throat> most of the time,、uh, people do agree on each other、uh, on each other's statements. So people agree with most of their neighbors on most of the things most of the time. It's just if you just look at the polarized social media or mainstream media, they focus on like the five things that people don't agree with and spends like ninety five percent of energy on it. But using this kind of platform where there's no reply button, we can focus on what we call rough consensus and just ratify the rough consensus while tabling this for the next iteration of decision. Okay, so effectively, what you're doing is using the social graph to identify common points of interest between、mm -hmm. what should be people would be people might consider as being. Politically divergent groups of individuals. individuals. They may still identify as divergent,、mm -hmm. but based on this way of interaction, where they cannot attack each other, people actually discover they agree on most of the things most of the time with most of the people. All right. So, what is the challenge of getting uh, uh, local and city、mm -hmm. and、uh, mm -hmm. national governments to adopt these types of platforms、mm -hmm. to、uh, encourage? Uh, more conversation. Well, first, <coughs> well, there's always the outside team, right? If if the governments flatly refuse to to deliberate substantially, we can always go back and occupy the parliament. And so, <laughs> the the outside game is really the key here. <laughs> But by giving people a taste of how how it feels like,、mm -hmm. in a few、uh, highlighted cases, and by making it continuous. Right, we were not saying you know the the one with five、um, thousand、um, you know petitions and e signatures we may consider responding. If there's a regulation that says we must respond point by point, and if it、uh, escalates to a referendum, then、uh, the legislation must also respond. And so the two keys is first to give binding power by way of law and regulation of the you know consensus points made. By these platforms, and second, to make sure that these platforms are continuous, in the sense that once we have a rough consensus, it's not done for good. Anyone can come back and challenge and modify and iterate on it. This builds a grace into the democratic、uh, citizenry because then people can accept a quote unquote defeat for a time and then、uh, work on a more nuanced comeback, maybe two months afterwards, maybe two years afterwards. Okay.、Um, So、uh, there's always this、uh, sense of balance of power, power within、uh, government and mm -hmm, citizenry. Mm -hmm. Yes.、Um, government right now isn't required、um, to、uh, include these types of participatory、uh, platforms. We have regulations now. So, so、uh, have, as of last year, they 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 now、okay. have to. Actually, so for for audiences that don't know, can you tell about how、yes. the regulations、yes. changed here in、right. Taiwan? So、uh, we talked briefly about sandbox.、Mm -hmm. So that's one key piece. It's not just a regulation because Taiwan is continental law system. There are actually acts、uh, passed by the parliament. Let's say the parliament cedes the right. To enforce their view of reality on fintech or self-driving vehicle or whatever, <clears throat> for one year,、uh, if the society thinks it's a better idea, it has a better version of a regulation, then they can make an exemption. And regardless of the own ministry, aside from money laundering and funding the terrorists, because we know what will happen if you experiment, anything else is fair game. <laughs> and so that requires a、um, you know explicit authorization by the legislation, and the legislation passed that because no legislators or regulators, for that matter, want to legislate something that they don't have first-hand experience on. 
this is very very risky, right? We just based on you know white papers or just sci-fi stuff uh, and try to regulate emerging things that we no, none of us have any firsthand experience of how to integrate with society. So the idea is that we crowdsource essentially those legal or regulatory experiments with the civil society and the private sector, with the understanding that this yeah is just for people to get the firsthand experience, and then we regulate later. And that is the, the new framework of lawmaking that we are using, the sandbox model. And the same goes for the e-petition. The e-petition has a national regulation that says, you know, 5,000 uh, signatures, uh, the ministries must come and respond substantially. If the petition can be solved in many different ways, like people petition for better healthcare resources in Hengchun, the southmost of Taiwan, it can be solved by deploying helicopters as ambulances, it can be solved by building a larger hospital, building a faster road or, or whatever, right? And if any of the ministries think other ministries own it, then that ministry is included in the multi-stakeholder process, but it doesn't absolve the original ministry of the duty. So this is what we call the ice bucket challenge clause uh, in the regulation. <laughs> you can name other people, but it doesn't uh, absolve you from participating in ice bucket uh, challenge. And so like five different ministries all come to Hengchun together to figure out a way to solve this in a way that is both feasible and also accepted by the general public. And so because all this is mandated by regulations and laws, uh, there really is no option for a ministry to opt out of the system, which is why we have now uh, around 100 participation offices in the ministry level, in the agency level, and also in Tainan City. So you, it's it's now propagated from uh, from the central government mm -hmm. down to uh, local, local government, government to municipalities at least. Yeah. Okay. Now uh, the uh, uh, there is a fun. If anything is shown in, since the two thousand sixteen election mm -hmm. in the United States and mm -hmm. uh, and um, and perhaps Brexit mm -hmm. is that uh, nation states are using mm -hmm. technology to create asymmetries. Mm -hmm. um, now, how do you? How do you prevent uh, an online platform like mm -hmm. uh, uh, Be mm -hmm. Taiwan mm -hmm. or Join from mm -hmm. uh, uh, from from bots? And mm -hmm. Yeah, well, in in Join, for example, people do have to authenticate using SMS numbers, uh, and but they're allowed to choose a pseudonym because of exactly because of power imbalances. Um, there was a public servant who petitioned with very wide appeal that uh, it used to be that we can only take half a day off uh, as public service, but now we can take uh, an hour off. As something as simple as this was almost impossible for people to, to raise in the original public service, but because of pseudonymity, uh, they can raise it without fear of repercussion. And it's now uh, adopted, so I can take one hour off any time. But in any case, <laughs> what, what I'm saying is that there is a, a trade between you know, asking for real names all the time versus you know anonymity in bots right you can solve for the authentication stage using sms but not disclosing the sms number to the ministries running the consultation it is only known uh, in the national development council running the platform and it's only reserved to use to prevent trolling and also for criminal investigation should uh you know a, a large scale you know botnet or whatever decide to take over the platform so we're pretty good at the cybersecurity layer in, in taiwan because because, well, we have a real like nation state adversary for persistent threats. So, uh, if people decide to engage in cybersecurity um, lessons, they don't have to solve abstract, um, you know, uh, goals and whatever uh, challenges. They can just look at the actual traffic and you know work on real cases. So, because of that, we maintain a very good relationship with the white hat um, hacker community. We allocate. 5% or more of all the government procurements on um, cybersecurity alone to support the industry. And the white hat hackers get you know, to get meet with ministers, with the president once in a while so that we make sure that um, they get paid and there's fame and then they don't go to the dark side, which always has cookies. And because of that, the cybersecurity layer is well protected and we've built the participation layer on top of that. And so recently, uh, ASUS was uh ASUS's uh, mm -hmm. software update system oh, yeah. was uh, mm -hmm. was yes. uh, cracked by mm -hmm. uh, uh, possibly from an advanced persistent threat actor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, and so um, the, the the shadow hammer. Sh yes, yeah, so shadow mm -hmm. hammer. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for those of you who don't know, shadow hammer is, is the 
uh, is the name given to uh, uh, given to the uh, software program used to uh, hack the ASUS um, Life software update. update system. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and this is uh, very much simple. Uh, this is basically the equivalent to, let's say, uh, Google updates or an Apple update. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, now, um, given that you know cybersecurity is is a very much a, a community effort. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know how how do you protect the mm -hmm. the anonymity of mm -hmm. the citizens using the platform? Right. So um, a few things. Um, so we identify only the the SMS number. So you can always post, uh, you know, using your families or your neighbors SMS number when participating in the petition on the joint platform. Um, and that provides some sort of distance um, between the people posting versus the people uh, making the comments. It's not perfect, so we're working on um, a even more uh, advanced form of what we call the PKI, the public key infrastructure, something like uh, what Estonia does. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, just as a background, when Estonia do uh, i-voting, uh, you can always use the face-to-face -face ballot to override your online ballot. That's something we also do here uh, for i-voting. But uh, m most importantly, it has a double envelope system <coughs> where the inside envelope using a national PKR card to authorize the, the vote is actually coming from you. There's a separate envelope that makes sure that the people running the election cannot identify back to who uh, submitted the vote. So basically it's a kind of two-way isolated process. Um, and we're looking into implementing that. Our main hurdle at the moment is our PKR card only reaches about 20% or so of population instead of like in Estonia, which is in the high 90%. Uh, so which is why next year uh, we're planning to roll out the PKI card as an additional function to the paper-based national identity card and we expect people to, because it's free, uh, to adopt it and, and turn on the PKI functions whenever they feel the need to file tax or you know buy a plane ticket or whatever uh, and then that would massively increase the PKI card's uh, adoption and the referendum is another vehicle because people can just get e-petitions on the e-referendum platform by next year. So if you get uh, 200,000 or so e-signatures, uh, your uh, vote on the referendum actually binds the legislation, unlike the joint platform, which only binds the administration. Uh, and so that is also a high incentive for people to get a PKI function on their national identity card uh, starting uh, October next year. All right, so you've taken steps to uh, help bridge that digital mm -hmm. divide. Right. Um, where are the area, other areas in the, that you feel um, uh, in the digital divide that persists here in Taiwan mm -hmm. or anywhere else that you, you may that needs to be addressed? Yes. So um, Taiwan is kind of unique because we're really small geographic wise. Uh, it's just one hour and a half from Taipei to Kaohsiung uh, by high speed rails from the north to the south. And so because of this, our internet penetration is around. 80% counting active users, uh, and uh, we have this national policy of broadband as human right. So anywhere in Taiwan, actually even in remote islands like Dongsha, if you don't have 10 megabits per second, it's our fault. Uh, and because of this, we make sure that the libraries in the digital opportunity centers all have free tablets for people to use. So at least on the communication hardware la layer, uh, there is equal opportunity for people. And so uh, working from the statistics that we show uh, uh, for the people's survey on the joint platform, we don't have that much age gap when it comes to to digital divide. The active participants are in their um, 60s or more and the, the teens, right? Mostly because these two groups of people have most time on their hands. Uh, but we do see a divide uh, on the especially indigenous uh, areas. Um, mostly because it's not just a linguistic translation thing. It's also a cultural translation thing. Uh, the indigenous um, nations, they may already have a form of participation of tribal assembly and the systems like like that, uh, so they're less um, inclined uh, to buy into a, a separate democratic process. Mm -hmm. So I think the trick here is twofold. The first one is that we translate our participation office and materials, not just to the six languages, um, including the Taiwanese languages, uh, but also Taiwanese indigenous languages, such as Amis, um, the language of our 
spokesperson uh, in the administration. And the second thing, aside from the linguistic and cultural translation, is we make sure that in the places where it's more than half um, of the population speaking indigenous or speaking a local uh, language, we make sure that public service is actually conducted over that language. The public officials need to learn that language, get certificates, and uh, uh, public uh, official documents are also written inside uh, the cultural framework of that language. And it's this is a long uh, work and since the president apology to the indigenous nations it's only been like two years or so but we expect that within a decade or so we will slowly shift to recognize the indigenous ways of policy making as its own legitimacy instead of asking them to come to the space of technology we bring the technology to amplify their space that, there's a cost of technology mm -hmm. um, um, and part of that part of the fundamental uh, Barrier in the digital mm -hmm. divide is that you know cell phones now cost like five hundred bucks. Like or, nothing. Or, nothing yeah. actually. In, yeah. in Taiwan, we have like those feature phones <laughs> that's still running Android. Yeah. So, okay. so it's really cheap. It is really cheap. It is really and and also cheap tablets. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then also the hardware security and the software mm -hmm. security. Um, who bears that cost? Mm -hmm. Right. So um, basically, there's, it, it's twofold. The critical infrastructure, of course, the uh, state bears that cost. Uh, we passed a new cybersecurity act just this year to make sure that critical infrastructures as well as all the government agencies are upgraded to the hardware supporting the latest security mechanisms and also dedicated personnel are there to ensure the safety. But uh, for portable devices, for personal devices, at the moment uh, what we do is that we publish the security um, you know, record, track records of those manufacturers but we don't, at, at the moment, interfere with um, you know, citizenry when uh, being advised uh, that of their security records that they still make such and such purchases. We just make sure that the critical infrastructure to connect to is not you know, vulnerable to the Trojans or to whatever malware they're running on the system. Uh, and we also um, have a set of cybersecurity awareness campaigns in a basic education system as part of the information literacy uh, that's part of the curriculum that's taking uh, effect this uh, August and so uh, I think we're one of the the actually the, the only uh, jurisdiction in, in Asia that includes media literacy critical thinking cybersecurity and so on not as its own class but as a kind of basic literacy across all the different classes okay and so uh, this uh, this this is really important mm -hmm. um, so is uh, is this is this required to, uh, in order to part use, is this literacy required mm -hmm. to participate, uh, required, sorry, I'm trying to yeah, it's, right. it's K-12. Yeah, All right. so it's, it's, it's K through 12. Big, yeah, yeah. It's K, it's K, K through 12, not yeah. just for uh -huh. for older adults. Right, so so it's lifelong learning, of course, but it's also K through 12. And especially, uh, like, starting this year, the first, the seventh, the tenth, grade will roll in the new curriculum, and part of the curriculum basically shifts the role of teachers. You used to be that teachers give standardized answers, people are asked to remember those answers, and, and as a high school dropout, junior high school dropout, I, I don't even understand why people want to memorize things when computers uh, do it much better. But in any case, uh, we're switching um, from the rote memorization to what we call character building and the basic literacy building in the new curriculum so that the teacher is just another learner that learns alongside the children. And that closes one of the mental backdoors uh, on which the misinformation, disinformation, and malware, uh, and Trojans, and phishing, uh, they circulate because there's no standard answer. The children learn that uh, it actually needs to start from autonomous understanding of the social or environmental or economic issue that they themselves want to solve. And the teacher help them to navigate the wealth of information online and offline. And so people learn to be critical thinkers uh, instead of you know being just consuming information. So when we talk about say open data in Taiwan, we always mean open data, both from the yeah. citizens and the uh, private sector, in addition to open government data. So we have people in uh, primary schools measuring their own air quality using like 100 US dollar, very cheap uh, air quality sensors and contributing to the data commons, data collaboratives, and learn themselves how to be a responsible data steward. And all of this helps shifting 
um, the narrative from a you know top-down approach was very susceptible to this information to a more grassroots approach. You you you've basically taken the UN SDGs and implemented mm -hmm. uh, this here in Taiwan, despite oh, yeah. Taiwan not being uh, recognized in the UN. But Taiwan can help. <laughs> I mean, literally, that's my name for it. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you should hold. Let me let me get a let me get a headshot of that one. That, that's actually that's actually worth it. Because okay. you know when I first saw the card, I was like, yeah. mm. <laughs> that's right. All right, let's see. Uh, we put it on, on literally everything. Like it's on my iPad. Okay. All right. Zoom in. Smile. <laughs> Wait. One, two, yeah. yeah. Taiwan can't help. That's uh, that, actually that should be a, a huge uh, slogan across uh, all of Taiwan's uh, communications. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right. Let's see what else is there. Um, uh, we didn't talk about Gov Zero. Can you mm -hmm. uh, should you tell people what Gov Zero is about? Right, so GovZero starts in late 2012. Uh, it's a very simple uh, idea. For all the public service uh, websites in Taiwan, that all ends in gov.tw, whenever people feel that uh, the public service isn't doing enough, or it isn't doing something that people really wanted to do, people don't have to protest. They can just set up an alternate government website by taking an existing government website address like ly.gov.tw and change the O to a zero, and then you get into the shadow government. So we don't have to buy you know, Google advertisements or Facebook advertisements. People learn the habit of just switching an O to a zero to get into the shadow government. And so the inaugural project of Gov Zero is budget G Zero E T W, uh, and it uh, basically turns every budget item in a national budget uh, and later on this municipal budget into social objects around which people can have a real discussion. And uh, the public service, for example, can come out and explain why this budget has been cut or this budget has been increasing and whether it's responding to people's ideas and things like that. So to be making it fun to talk about individual budget items rather than budget as a whole, right? And, and because GovZero projects all relinquish most of their copyright under the Creative Commons license uh, regime, uh, Taipei City and later on the joint platform and the national platform all adopted this visualization. So now if you go to join GOVTW, you see the same budget visualization uh, for all the hundreds of the ministerial projects and the uh, public service is guaranteed to give you a response whenever you type in something to ask about the budget items. And so it really kind of uh, makes a separate channel aside from the mainstream journalism and from the representatives and the MPs so that people can have a real dialogue with the public service uh, entirely online. And so basically GovZero is prototyping. It's kind of like a pilot and face to see whether people like this idea of public service. And if it's a good idea, then the government merges back into the public service proper. All right. So looks like you've got someone else coming here to see you. No, 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 no. Oh. it's my colleague. Oh, hi. <laughs> uh, I'm not taking your desk space, am I? No. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Um, is there anything that you'd like to tell the policymakers mm -hmm. in Europe and America who are attending this conference? Mm -hmm. um, uh, your hopes uh, mm -hmm. for uh, for transformative change mm -hmm. uh, in mm -hmm. government? Sure. So um, there's three conditions uh, that I adopted, uh, publicly negotiated when I became digital minister in October 2016. Uh, and they are voluntary association, meaning that all my colleagues, for example, the, um, the lady just joined us from the Ministry of Education. And we, in our office, we have uh, the Ministry of Culture, of Interior, National Communication, and so on. So this is a horizontal scene, uh, a assemblage uh, with all the different ministries people. And I go, don't give them orders. I don't take orders. All I do is that we ensure that any idea that they brainstorm uh, is radically transparent. Uh, and that is very important because Previously, the ministers take all the credit if things go right, and they can always blame the public service if things go wrong. But now, with radical transparency, the journalists and the general public 
can identify who exactly is the public servant that came up with innovative ideas, and so they get a credit. But if things go wrong, well, the system builder, that's me, take all the blame. And so by shifting the matrix of paying out, we do discover that the public service is very good at innovating. And finally, the third, aside from voluntary association and radical transparency, is location independence. So that allows uh, for me to travel around Taiwan to have very nice office space like here and still counting as doing work. And this is important because we need to empower uh, mm -hmm. the people who are closest to the pain. And so by bringing the ministry's people to the people closest to the pain, either through telepresence or through co-location of office facilities, we make sure that uh, we can mutually enhance the availability of data by checking, for example, the air quality measurements and devising ways like through distributed ledger to make sure that nobody can change each, each other's numbers. Uh, we make sure that an effective partnership is built by the presidential hackathon, by the sandbox mechanism, by the petition mechanism, participatory budgeting, and finally we make sure that innovation that we build uh, is open in the sense that we co-create instead of you know being a colonizing power uh, like some other economies. And so my job description as the digital minister uh, is a poem actually. So it goes like this. When we see the internet of things, let's take it to be the internet of beings. When we see uh, virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. And when we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that a singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. So that's my message. Can we just do that one more time? Because uh, but we, we, we probably, sure. probably lost audio sure. uh, from the door. No, it's fine. So just the, the last part? Yeah. Let me just grab that. Mm -hmm. Does it work? Yeah, okay. Okay. Right, so of all the sustainable development goals which Taiwan can help, uh, personally, I focus on uh, to build trustworthy data collaboratives with the civil society and the private sector through efforts like the presidential hackathon, uh, the personal tours around Taiwan, the working with the social entrepreneurs, and then uh, we foster effective partnership across sectors. Just this year, we're giving out the Asia-Pacific Social Innovation uh, Partnership Award that doesn't award individuals, but rather partnerships across sectors. And finally, we make sure that innovation that we build this way is uh, open in the sense that we're not co uh, controlling it in a colonizing way, but co-creating with other international counterparts. And so my job description as the digital minister is actually a poem. It goes like this. When we see the Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. And when we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that the singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. We're good. Perfect. Yay. Okay. Uh, one last question, sure. if yes, I can. Of course. Can. Um, network propaganda has, mm -hmm. is a serious uh, yes. problem. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> you, as digital minister, mm -hmm. how do you how do you see mm -hmm. government and your role mm -hmm. here as addressing these? Uh, yeah, addressing we make these viral things? media clips, um, like sixty minutes um, after each uh, popular disinformation or propaganda or misinformation came online. We have a citizen flagged system that is built by the GovZero initiative, not sponsored by the government, that let us know what is the most rampant rumors being spread on end-to-end -end encrypted channels, such as the line, uh, which is like WhatsApp uh, here in Taiwan. And so we take uh, basically a uh, partnership role with the line company to post our real-time clarifications side by side uh, in the line uh, app and we make sure that our message is clear enough 
is timely enough, is structured data, and we make sure that it goes viral before the disinformation goes viral. And I think just by being proactive in our communication messages and by making it very clear that anyone who has any doubt about anything digital can just come to me on Wednesday and we'll have a 40 minutes talk. Uh, we make sure that rumors and disinformation have very limited room to grow and we also rely, of course, on independent fact checkers like the Taiwan Fact Checking uh, Center, part of the International Fact Checking Network. Uh, to do the due diligence and fact checking in the front of the public and we work with um, large platforms such as Facebook which is committed to sometime this year maybe in June uh, to say if anything is fact checked as wrong by the Taiwan Fact Checking Center they're committed to dial down the virality of that message on Facebook uh, to less than one-fifth uh, of the previous so this is much like this fun because email is private communications the state shouldn't pry into your email but if you flag your email as spam, then it goes to a clearinghouse called spam house. And if sufficient people do this flagging, the new incoming emails fitting this pattern goes into the junk mail folder. It's not per se censorship because you, if you have too much time on your hands, you can still go through your junk mail folder, but it doesn't by default waste people's time. Now, how much of this is known by Taiwan Civic Society? Well, this, this, uh, uh, the production of these videos and Right. Um, our premier, and especially our deputy premier, <laughs> has a viewership um, easily in, in millions. And our president recently partnered with YouTubers. Uh, and so people who follow those YouTubers now naturally know that we're shifting into a very fast-paced communication side. Uh, for people of an older generation who are using LINE, uh, actually today is the day that they will discover that LINE has a separate section for the government real-time clarifications. Maybe we should do that in Chinese. That way, mm -hmm. then then you actually have a clip you can. It's, it's okay. We, we, we have, have clips in Chinese. All right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank All you so right. much. All right. Great. Thank you. Yay. Appreciate it. Uh -huh. Very, 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 very impressed. Thank you. So. Um,